Hi, it's Minister Tara Owens from Christ the Rock Community Church in Cooper City, Florida. Thank you for taking the time to tune in today, wherever you may be watching or listening. Today's sermon comes from a study titled, Live a Praying Life. In John chapter 17, Jesus himself prays what is called the high priestly prayer. And in Luke chapter 11, the disciples ask Jesus to teach them to pray. I think what we see is that Jesus himself prayed which teaches us we need to pray, as well as the disciples said, teach us to pray. It is not a natural discipline, but it's one you and I can learn. So get a pencil, pull out a notebook, and take some notes as we learn how to live a praying life. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before you tonight in our second week of Live a Praying Life. And it is really something how in so much of already of this study and we have discussed about distractions and hindrances, things that we deal with that hinder our prayer life. Even tonight, distractions uh, that we've had to encounter as a staff and just trying to make sure things run smoothly. Those things can distract us from the main purpose. But I pray that you would align our hearts and minds tonight to the main purpose of what the Holy Spirit wants to teach each and every one of us about this spiritual discipline called prayer. A spiritual discipline that does not come natural to any person. But as we grow in knowing you, we are more disciplined in praying and seeking you. The more we discover who you are through the scriptures and our personal relationship with you is the, the more we desire to spend time and talk to you and not just talk to you, but it is the more that we desire to listen to what you have to say and to be obedient to what you call us to do for the glory of your name. We thank you for every woman that's here as you have us all individually on a journey and then collectively on a journey as your daughters. Lord, my plea, not just for my sisters in here, but for myself as well, is that you would help us, and we know you will, because this is in line with your will. You want us to pray. So help us to meet the challenges, meet the distractions with um, a resilience with a determination to not give up. And for some of us, that means just taking small steps. And so we don't compare ourselves to anyone. We just go on the journey with you. We ask you to teach us tonight. Teach us, Holy Spirit. Silence our hearts from ways that it would want to wonder, our minds from ways that it would want to wonder. And allow us to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to each and every one of us. We know there is power in prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to be mostly in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus tonight. So you can open up your Bible there. Particularly, we will spend a large portion of our time in Exodus chapter 32 and 33. But I'll also hit some other scriptures, too, if time permits. I want to remind you on uh, last week, we talked about disambiguation, just the noise and how silencing the noise uh, so that we could hear more clearly and what the Lord is saying to us and silence the noise of other things and other people in our lives that really hinder us uh, in our prayer life. Uh, one thing for sure is prayer really is something that the Lord has to teach us how to pray. Um, we were talking in our table leaders meeting that if I, if I were to ask you how many of us are intercessors, not everyone's hand will go up because we don't see ourselves as intercessors. We aren't a part of an intercessory ministry or uh, we don't, we're, we're not one of those people where the Lord wakes you up at certain times of the morning or the night and burdens you with, with something uh, or shows you deep things that you have to keep secret or to yourself and cause you to pray on. So most of us would say we are not uh, intercessors, but I want us to understand tonight in this room, we are all intercessors. 
Every woman in here tonight who is a child of God, you are an intercessor because he has called you and I to pray. In Luke chapter 11, remember we just, just briefly, I want to just review that. When the disciples had, uh, they had observed Jesus praying in a certain place, and the Bible says in Luke chapter 11, in a certain place Jesus was praying, and the disciples had observed him praying. They asked Jesus, who is their teacher? They were a disciple of Jesus. So they asked their teacher, Lord, would you teach us to pray just as John had taught his disciples to pray? And, and we established those three questions. Why pray? Well, it, the Bible makes it clear that we should pray, and Jesus was praying, and as disciples of Jesus, he, if he prayed, we most certainly should pray. And then when, when there, you know, we pray for a lot of different reasons, but when we should pray every day and we have a praying spirit, we pray throughout the day. It may be bursts of spontaneous prayers. It may be long prayers, but we agree we should pray when, when it's necessary, when it is not, it is our connection to the heavenly father. So it's always, it's not a problem that sends us to pray. It is because we have a relationship with the Lord and we need direction. We need instruction. I was saying to one of the young ladies, we were having a conversation, you know, I said, it's even more aware, more and more to me, even before I open my mouth in a conversation that I have to have, I need to stop sometimes and just say, Lord, okay, what do you have me to say? Amen? Because everything that may be on our heart and our mind is not necessarily what he would have us to share. <laughs> and so we have to ask him, and so then where, for some of us, we have particular places that in our homes or and while we're driving, we have certain places where we pray. And then there are certain times, there are certain areas or circumstances in our life that we can really denote. We have a, we have a, a marking in our head of in this certain place place. I prayed all the time about this particular situation. So there are certain places in our homes that we remember. This was a season of my life where I prayed in my bedroom every night on my knees because we were going through certain circumstances. We have a where. But the truth is we know we all should pray. I want to read to you as we started out last night, last, last week on this topic of prayer. I said that it would be a fight. And that's why I encourage you to hang in there to press on in and to see what the Lord is teaching you, because it will be a battle. You are heading into one of the spiritual disciplines that keeps us connected to our Heavenly Father and to what he's doing in the kingdom and what he's doing in our lives. And so you got to know, you and I got to know, it is going to be a fight to pray, to keep ourselves in that posture of prayer. Well, with that, I want to read to you what one of the sisters shared on her, her post before we go into our lesson tonight. I asked her if I could share it. She said, on Wednesday night, Speaking of last week, she said, I went back to Bible study. Why? Because I really need it. She talked about the fact of her being a flawed person. She's a constant work in progress. And she talked about the fact how so the Bible study brings a certain amount of peace in her life. And she's less of a crazy wife and mom when she goes to Bible study. <laughs> she said, the study is living a praying life. We were given fair warning that once we start to be more intentional about praying, we will be attacked. It's exactly what the enemy doesn't want us to do. Well, I had no idea it would be so quickly. My anxiety level went through the roof yesterday. My thoughts ran wild. After falling asleep at 1 a.m., I was wide awake at 3.15 a.m. Even though I felt irritated, I got out of bed at 4 a.m. Not my idea of fun. I had a choice to make, though, either lie in bed and continue to feel annoyed or to spend time reflecting on all the good things he fills my life with. Yep, it was a choice. So I poured a cup of coffee, sat in silence, silence, sat in silence, and I reflected on my journey. I'm learning more and more that I can resist or I can lean into the situation. The journey feels like a roller coaster. And for some of us, we're already there where we're starting to feel this challenge in prayer. And we can feel, anybody where you can feel like you've already asked the Lord, teach me, show me how to pray. And there are some things he's already adjusting and silencing some areas in our lives that need to be silenced. This week, as we studied the purpose of prayer in, in reference to the sovereignty of God, I love the quote on page 20 that says about the sovereignty of God. To say that God is sovereign is to say that he is under no rule or authority outside himself. His sovereignty is combined with his all-powerfulness. 
He not only has all authority, he has all power. There is no power outside of himself. For me, this brings me comfort. And this means that, I, you know, there's a comfort in knowing I, I, how many of us have thought, you know, we can really change our mind. But this gives me comfort. There's no changing his mind. But what this does teach me is that I have an invitation, you and I, to join him through prayer and what he's doing on the earth. We can decide to align our hearts with his through prayer and be conduits for him on this earth as he moves in situations for his glory. So I thought tonight the Lord kept leading me to the first leader of Israel, Moses. And I tell you even more as I studied Moses, I've studied Moses' journey in terms of leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. But I've never studied Moses' journey in the terms of him being a praying man. I've never looked at him being a praying man. I've just thought of him as the deliverer for the children of Egypt, the man that didn't want to go, who said all of his flaws, who had all of his reasons of why he didn't need to be the person that God would choose. But I never saw him before as a praying man. But we're going to look at Israel's first leader tonight, and we're going to teach, we're going to learn as he teaches us something through the power of prayer. Three points I want, if you're taking notes tonight, we're going to talk about the cause, the call, and the commitment. The cause, the call, and the commitment. Because Moses teaches us a lesson about being called and taking the invitation to join God and a cause and being committed. And more and more, I tell you, when I did this study five years ago, I didn't, it's so different for me right now because it's becoming more clear to me that if we do not understand and approach prayer from a biblical basis, we are going to think prayer is a means of getting what we want and getting what we think is best. And it is not. It is not about that at all. Someone said to me on last week, you know, the heart knows what it wants. It doesn't know what it needs. And that's the truth. But as we study and learn the character of God and he teaches us about prayer, our hearts will come in line with what he desires for us. Psalms 37 and 4 says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And so what is it as we look at this man, Moses, tonight and you and I are, can say at the end of this, Lord, would you take charge of my heart and would you give me the desires in my heart that will come in align with your will for my life? Moses. So let's start right here. In Genesis chapter 12, and I, don't, I wish I had the time to go all the way through it. In Genesis chapter 12, Moses is not in Genesis chapter 12, but Abraham is. And God comes to Abraham and he makes Abraham, he says, leave your family, leave your country where you are. And I'm going to show you a land where to go and I will make you into a great nation. There is this promise. There is this covenant. There will come a great nation out of you. And Abraham strikes out and from Genesis chapter 12, more happens with him getting to this point of this promised child. God appears to him again and he promises him an heir. And Abraham and Sarah try and make it happen their way, and it doesn't work that way. But in Genesis chapter 21, Isaac is born. And then Isaac goes through his own journey. And the Lord, then Jacob shows up on the scene. And then from Jacob, this whole line of sons are born. And in Genesis, Joseph is born. And Joseph grows up and has brothers who do not like him. And Joseph in Genesis ch chapter 37 has a, a thing that happens to him where his brothers want to get rid of him and he's sold into slavery. And perhaps you're sitting there thinking now, what in the world does this have to do with Moses? You'll see in a minute. And then in Genesis 46 and 47, as Joseph has been there and he has found favor with God, he has been in prison because of Potiphar's wife telling a lie on him. He's gone through some things, but God has given him wisdom of a famine that's going to take place the, where his family live. They need food. They come to Egypt and the whole thing of this reconciliation with the family and the brothers and Jacob, all of them move there. And then I want you to see this. This is what happens. And Exodus, I hope if you open, just you're right there in your Bible. Just, just go back just one to Genesis chapter, the last chapter of Genesis. I want you to see what happens there. The family has settled in Goshen. They're there. And as you get to this last chapter of Genesis 
50, you see where Joseph, there is the death of Joseph. Joseph is dead. But then, as you look at this, and it says in 22, now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household. You see that? And Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, also the sons of Machar and the sons of Manasseh were born on Joseph's knees. So Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to whom? Abraham. Come on, say with me, to whom? Abraham. To Isaac and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years old, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Now turn to Exodus chapter 1. Now it goes through Exodus chapter 1. Where it says, now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. They came each one with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Jeb, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the persons who came from the lawns of Jacob were 70. That's important. If you're circling anything, that's so important. All of them that came with a number of whom? Come on, you're going to help me teach tonight. They're whom? You're going to get something out of this tonight with Moses and being a pray, praying man, and you're going to see the cause, the call, and the commitment that I pray will change the way we live our life and that we approach prayer. They were 70 in number, but Joseph was already in Egypt. Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. So wait a minute. But Joseph was already in Egypt and Joseph did what? He did what? And all his brothers and all that generation, right? But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and they multiplied and they became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Now here we go. Verse 8. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we are. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor, and they built for Pharaoh stored cities. Well, wait a minute. They go into to slavery in Exodus chapter 1. You see that? And it says there were 70 of them in number, and they are multiplying. They, they're multiplying, but they go into slavery. And then in Genesis chapter 2, so Israel is in slavery. You with me? Everybody, no, now here's, here's where it gets good, where we get into the body of tonight. In Exodus chapter 2, now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and she bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no more, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds and by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile while her maidens walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket amongst the reed and sent her maids and she brought it to her. When the ch he opened it, she saw the child and behold, the boy was crying and she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said, go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Wait a minute. You see Moses coming on the scene. You see Moses coming on the scene. You're with me. You see Moses coming on the scene. I want you, to th you and I to think of this in, in tonight as we've come on the scene the day that you were born. The day that you were born, I, I, need you to get, I need you to get a different perspective of why you and I are here on this earth. Moses came on the scene for a purpose and a reason, and so did you, so did I, bigger than what he could ever imagine was going to happen to him. Now, I want you to see God in the grand scheme of this. This is huge. The woman had a baby, nursed him for up to the point to where she could nurse him no more, put him in a basket, strategically sends him down the river, and it ends up, his real mother ends up nursing him. 
that God is in the midst. God has a bigger plan and view. And so here it is. You find Moses himself is born into this whole thing of, of the Israelites being in slavery. He grows up there. And then look what happens in Genesis chapter 2 and 11. 2 and 11, this is what happens to him. Now it came about in those days when Moses had done what? He had grown up. He went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. He went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, why are you striking your companion? But he said, who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you kill the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, surely the matter has become known. Verse 15, when Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from his presence and settled in the land of where? He sat down by a well. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit what's happened so we can get into our first point. Moses grows up in this palace. He, he's been growing up in this palace not knowing that one day that he would go on the run. And as he would go on the run, he would run right into the calling that God has on his life. He's grown up in a palace, and here it is. This is what happened. He sets out to try and help in a way God has not called him to help. See, the desire was on his heart. But he didn't know how to meet that desire. He had taken things into his own hand. And for many of us in here tonight, there are some desires that we have on our heart that are from God. There are some things he has really called us to do, but he's saying through prayer, you're going to find out exactly how I want you to get them done. Because right now you're doing them in your own strength. You're trying to do them your own way. But when you come to me, I do have that calling on your life. I have placed that desire in your heart, but in order for it to come to fruition, you have got to walk with me in this place. So Moses runs and he goes to Midian. And when he goes to Midian, he, find, he, he gets a whole new different life. If you read the rest of that chapter, Moses meets up with Sephora and he gets married and he has a baby boy. So I want us to see Moses has a completely different life now. Life is different for Moses. He settled in, he's got a wife and he's got a kid. He doesn't have any plans in his heart right then or in his mind. You don't read anywhere where Moses says, well, now I'll go back to Egypt and try and help out the Hebrews. He has settled into Midian. But God has a bigger plan in mind. There is a cause. Look at Exodus 2, 23. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 says to us, now it came about in the course of many days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel and God took notice of them. Here is point number one. There is the cause in Exodus 2.23. Moses, as I said, was in Midian, settled into a different life, now a family man. I want to ask you a question if you're taking notes. Do you understand the call on your life? Do you understand the call of God on your life? Because it is so much bigger than just... Sometimes how we think that we, we, are, we live in a world that teaches us to be selfish and to think of ourselves. So not that there is anything wrong with praying for ourselves and asking the Lord for things that concern us. But can we just be honest? And this is this is one of the most difficult topics for me to teach on. But can we just be honest? How many of us, when we first get on our knees, we're thinking about everybody else and we're last? Come on. Anybody? Let me see your hand because I. Okay, there's about one or two of you. God bless you. We do not join you. <laughs> Come on, I, I, think, I don't think we'll get anywhere really with this prayer topic until we're honest. Prayer is a challenge because we are so consumed with ourselves. 
We're so consumed with our own needs. We're so consumed with what we think should be in our life. We're consumed with our problem. So we have so much noise. We have so many distractions. We're so inundated with everything that says, think of me, think of me, and God is the one who's supposed to make it happen for me. We go to God, not necessarily to see what God's plan is. We're going to God to tell him what our plan is. And so here it is, Mother, there's this call, and God, there's a cause. There's a cause. And I have, to, I have to press this in tonight to you millennials, to everybody in here, you have a cause. And you need to be asking God, what is that cause that you have on my life? What is it? What is it? Because it's linked to bigger than you. God has placed you here for his kingdom purposes. And we see this in Moses. Well, how? Here it is from the cause. There is a call. And I'm going to tell you, can you, I want you to get a, just get a visual of Moses now. Moses has grown up in the palace, in Egypt, in comfort. He is not in comfort anymore. It's a different life for him. A completely different life for him. But I'm sure he, he, He's disconnected. He's, at least he's not in slavery. He was on the run for his, for his life when he got to Midian. Can, there's a, a lot of emotions that Moses probably was feeling. And in the midst of that, look at God's plan. In Genesis, in Exodus chapter 3, it says, Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness. There's a place. He came to Horeb the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. Sight! Why the bush is not burned up? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Wait a minute. When he calls us. Wait a minute. We said we want to pray. Come on, ladies, come on. You coming back next week? Come on, let's just get real. When he calls us, because I, you don't find anywhere else in Scripture where the Lord uses a bush, a burning bush, to get anybody's attention. Come on, and anybody had a burning, you, you haven't had a burning bush. Nobody's had a burning bush. But I want to tell you this. He is using something to get your attention. Oh, yes, he is. And I have to ask you, are you so so filled with yourself or so busy with all the distractions that you can't even pay attention that this is what he is using to absolutely get your attention. And perhaps it is that problem that you're dealing with. Perhaps it is that relationship. Perhaps it is that thing at work where you think everybody else is wrong, but he's telling you, no, it's you. Perhaps you don't know. What, what, what is he using to get your attention? Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. And so we're saying, Lord, you know what? I really, I, re I really want this praying life. And perhaps we're like the sister with the Facebook page that I read to you. We want this praying life, but now not at 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> but we're trying to be specific with when it is he can wake us up. But Moses, he's, Moses answers him. Ladies, if you, if, you, if you could just ask the Lord, what is it that he's using right now to get your attention? This desire that you've had on your heart that you keep talking to him about could be the very thing he's using to get your attention. That through that particular thing, he's saying, no, I want to teach you something else about me. This is not about the prayer being answered a certain way. I want you to know my will for your life. Moses says, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, remove your sandals. From your feet, from the, for the place you're, which you're standing, it's holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father. He identifies himself. Ladies, I believe the Lord wants to identify himself to us in a deeper way. But you and I have to be open to it. He's, he, he wants to, he says, I am the God of, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And, and Lord, thank you, Holy Spirit. And for some of us, it is that, that place where he's saying, you know what? You're afraid to see me in this way. You're afraid to see me. 
I, you know me. See, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And then, then Moses, once he says that to him, then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Are we afraid for the Lord to take us deeper and reveal more of himself to us? Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. Who are even, now, wait a minute. I, thank you. Did, did the Lord say to Moses, Moses, I have surely seen your affliction. I know you were down in Egypt, and I, I know you tried to help them, two Hebrews. I know, I know you killed that, that one, that Egyptian that was messing with the other one. That was, you weren't supposed to do it that way, Moses. That wasn't, I know you were trying to be helpful, uh, and Moses, and I know, I know it wasn't right for Pharaoh to threaten to take your life. And I know you're on the run in, in Midian, and that's where you are right now, and you're safe, and you got a wife and a son. You got a cute little son, his name is God. I, 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 he's not going through any of that with what Moses has experienced. He's not even talking to Moses about Moses. <laughs> Does anybody... I mean, he's not even talking to Moses about himself. He approaches Moses about a bigger thing, about the cause. Then the Lord said, after he's seen, he said, I've seen, I've heard their cry because of the taskmasters, and I'm aware of their suffering. So I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from a land uh, to a good and spacious land, now flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Parasites, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel have come to me. Furthermore, I've seen the oppression from the Egyptians. So he says to Moses in verse 10, now, there, come now. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh so that you can bring my people the sons of Israel, even now, wait a minute. We, waited. we talked about the call, the, the cause, right? So we're into the call now. So wait a minute. He's called Moses, and he says, um, the place you just left? Come on, anybody getting anything from this? You, you with me? This is not what you wanted to hear about prayer, is it? Moses, the place you just left, where they were trying to kill you? That's the call I got on your life. I want you to go back right there. <laughs> and, and ladies, I really believe this with my whole heart as he just kept get, keeping me with this, with Moses, was for some of us, it is the very thing that we have tried to escape from that he is calling us back to. The very thing that you've been running from, he says, no, that's the call that I have for you. The very thing that you don't want to deal with is the call that I have for you, that I am going to work through prayer so that you understand my will on this earth and that situation. That very thing that you're running from is not only going, you're going to be a conduit for me, but you're going to see me differently. I'm going to grow you. I'm going to mature you. I'm going to give you desires that are in your heart. You're going to get a, a bigger view. You're going to get a kingdom view instead of that small mindset that you now have concerning that situation. That was so good the air came on because they know I'm hot. <laughs> I promise you this just stayed on me because I had to think, how small-minded am I about my own life? How selfish am I about my own life that I don't get, I don't say when I get on my knees, God, what is your, what is your will for today? How, how do you want to work through me for today, what do you want me to say to someone today that would cause them to see you? Before I react in that situation, how do you want me to react so that you're glorified? Amen. The very thing that I don't want to deal with, how do you want me to deal with it so that your will can be done in that situation? So Moses has this, this call. How He's drawing you. Jeremiah chapter 1, he says to the prophet, look, before... You were born before you were born I, in your mother's womb. I knew you already. He knows you. He said, and I, I, he said to Jeremiah, I already had a prof appointed you as a prophet to the nations. You already had a call on your life. If you and I can stop and see, just like Moses was born for a purpose, you and I, was, we were born for a purpose. Can we just get to that point to where you are not here just existing? You weren't here because somebody just decided they wanted a baby girl or didn't want a baby girl and you showed up. God knows you and he has you here for a purpose. 
Psalms 25 and 4 through 5, which was in our, in our Bible study. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth. Teach me, for you're the God of my salvation. On thee I'll wait all day long. He gives Moses this invitation that was specific for him through the burning bush. Specific just for him. But I want us to see something in Moses' commitment tonight. The third point, his commitment is that Moses is so committed now. I can't go through all of Moses' journey. But when God tells Moses to go, Moses has every reason why. He tells God, look, I'm not an eloquent speaker. Can't do it. <laughs> so when we start praying to God and he starts revealing, he starts speaking to us. Can I just ask you, if you don't mind, because I, I do this because it's freeing. To me, it's freeing. How many of us got some, if he said that, Lord, if we got some, I can't do it. Come on. Lord, minister to that person. I, I can't do it. Anybody? I'm, we're the only ones that got some. Com Come on. Everybody's got some. I can't, I can't do it. Thank you. Moses, Moses had some. Moses had insecurities. Can I just tell you, everybody in here, I don't care how, I don't care how confident the person comes across to you and you are saying, boy, she is an absolutely, extremely confident woman. Every woman in here got some insecurities. Yeah. Everyone. Every one of us in here, we have flaws. Every one of us. Every one of us have some places that if he asks me to go, I'll be honest, I don't want to go. I'm okay praying, saying, Lord, use me to go to Honduras, but I don't want to live there. <laughs> Being honest. Come on. Everybody's got something. I don't mind going on a missions trip. I, I, I want to come back home. We all got something. And so when he says to Moses, this is what I, can you imagine Moses had every reason and every reason to have an apprehension to fear going back to people who where he was, he had just left running from them and then the Lord's going to send them back. But I want you to see Moses' commitment when he gets through. And you know, if you, if you are not a Bible student, I encourage you to read it all. I got 10 minutes that I got to wrap up this commitment because I want us to get some points from what we see Moses do with these people. Because he, he answers the call. He understands the cause. He answers the call. And then Moses is completely committed. His heart comes in line with the Lord. So he goes throughout. He, you know, Moses goes through the plague. He goes to Egypt. He goes back and forth. Pharaoh rejects him. He goes through so much. He goes through uh, that. It, just rejected on every level. Even some of the Hebrew people start to turn on them because they say, you're making it hard on us because you're trying to get us out. And in the midst of God really keeping his covenant promise, in the midst of God saying, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and where he said in Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. In the midst of all of that, these people have been in slavery for 400 years. Doesn't look like God's answering the prayer. Doesn't look like God's keeping his covenant. Like, can I encourage you that there are just times that we just, that's because we don't know all of his plans. We don't know all of his ways. He doesn't give us all the details. And sometimes you and I, we go, well, what's the need praying anymore? What's the need in seeking him anymore? But in the midst of this, he's working everything out. And Moses goes through this. Now they finally get out. And this is where I have to full swing to Exodus chapter 32 because they're out of, they're out of Egypt now. They get delivered. God's going to teach them how to worship. You got a people, and this is important. You got a people that have been in Egypt their whole life. All they know are other gods. That's all they know is idol worship. And they got to learn how to worship God and Here's the, here's the point, even with Moses, they got to learn how to respect their leader and obey him, what he gets from God. But in Genesis chapter, in Exodus chapter 32, sorry, Exodus chapter 32, this happens. Moses has delayed to come down from the mountain. We're going to see his commitment. He didn't come down from the mountain fast enough, and the people assembled around Aaron and said to him, come on, 
You make us a God. Because it's taken Moses too long. They said, we don't know what happened to him. So they take off their gold rings. They take off everything. And Aaron makes this God for them. And then in verse 7, you see, the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once for your people. We always love when, when, when he says that, right? For he says, for your people. When he says, for your people. Now, I love this, though, because what God is saying, and I love that you laugh because this is going to make it a lot easier on you. You laughed at it. We love that. Don't Minister Luce and I talk about that sometimes. We love it that Moses goes, those are your people. And God says, no, those are your people. And it's like, no, those are your people. No, those are your people. But I want you to understand this is what he's saying. God says, they're your people because I've entrusted them to you. And when he puts a call on our life and he's given us a cause, what he's saying, young ladies, is that I did it because I'm trusting you with it. It's yours. I'm expecting you to do something with it. I'm expecting you to honor me with it. I'm expecting some glory for my name. I'm trusting you. So while you just laughed and said, your people, you and I have to look and say, what has he given us? Because he's saying, that's yours. But it's yours because I gave it to you. And it's yours because I'm expecting you to do something with it that honors me. And the only way you and I are going to know what to do with it and how to handle it is to seek his hand. And we see Moses. Moses is going to God. He's to deal with this many people. I want you to know that when he comes out, the Bible says there's 600,000 of them. And that's not including the children. 600,000. Most of us in here would quit. <laughs> because you know he had to deal with a lot of noise. But look at what, it, what he says in verse 11. It says, they've done all of this. And so oh, I want you to go back. No, I want you to see verse 9. Which says, the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. And behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then let me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them and I will make you a great nation. Now, wait a minute. Oh, God, I love this when I was studying this. God, I was like, what a man to pray. What an unselfish man. I, I don't want you to miss that. Look at that. He says now, the Lord says, let me alone, Moses, that my anger may burn against them. I'm going to destroy them. Them cutting up people, them stiff-necked people. But he says, Moses, I'm going to keep my promise to you. Hey, I'm still going to make you a great nation. Now, I got to ask, how, much, how many of us would have been like, oh, good. <laughs> you going to make me a great nation? That's great. I still get, hey, I get it because I've been good. I've been a good leader. I've answered the call. I know what the cause is. They're giving me all this trouble. So go ahead and do what you want to do with them, God. I'm good. <laughs> but no, Moses has a bigger view. Man, I love this. It, Moses then does what you and I, this is what we got to get in, in these next few minutes about prayer. Verse 11, then it, Moses entreated the Lord, his God, and said, oh, Lord. Why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak saying with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger, change your mind and do about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and all this land which I have spoken. I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Now, if we stuck right there, we said, oh, he did change his mind. No. So it was always his will. 
not to harm the people. It was always his will. But here it is, you see a man standing in the gap and praying for somebody. You all, if we could just get this, boy, there is so much power to us standing in the gap. In Ezekiel, you studied it when he said, when I looked for a gap man, I couldn't find anybody to stand in the gap. We have through prayer the power, the, 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 the wonderful invitation in working with God and aligning ourselves and God hears our prayers and it's like Moses is saying remember remember God not that God forgot but he sees a man that is so in tune that it touches his heart he never wanted to destroy the people it was always a promise and he even said to Abraham I'll still make you into a great nation but God did not destroy the people what could happen with you and I praying and then I have to jump over on ver on chapter on verse 30 because as soon as Moses prays for him, they cut up again. <laughs> Doesn't it sound like us? They cut up again. And on, ver uh, on verse 30 says, on the next day, Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin. And now I'm going up to the Lord. Moses goes up to the Lord from he's committed. He goes up to the Lord again for them. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, at last, this people has committed, they committed a great sin and they've made a God of of gold for themselves, but now if you will forgive their sin, and if not, wait a minute, gosh, this gets me, please blot me out from your book, which you have written, the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book, but now you go and leave the people where I told you, behold, now I'm, I'm going to end on this, two minutes, this is going to bless you, he says, nevertheless, my angel will go before you. I'm going to send my angel. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Then the Lord smote the people because of what they did with the calf, which Aaron had made. Then look at verse 30, at chapter 33, verse 1. Then the Lord smote, spoke to Moses and said, depart, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. I will send an angel before you. I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Parasite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. He's keeping his promises. Go up to the land, flowing with milk and honey. But I'm not going in your midst because you are an obstinate people and I might destroy you on the way. <laughs> when the people heard this sad word, they went into mourning and none of them put on ornaments. For the Lord has said to Moses, say to the sons of Israel, you are an obstinate people. Should I go up in your midst? For one moment I might destroy you. Now therefore put off your ornaments from you that I may know what I shall do with you. I'm almost done. So the sons of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp a good distance from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out of the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about whenever Moses went out of the tent that all the Israel, all the people would rise and stand each at the entrance of the tent and gaze at Moses until he entered the tent. Now, I want to skip down to verse 12 because I want you to get this. Then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name. You have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I found favor in your sight, let me know your ways. Show me your path. Teach me. That I may know you. I want to know you more. So that I may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence shall go with you. And I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I, and your people may be distinguished from all the other people who are on the face of the earth? I want you to write these four things down. If you notice this with Moses, Moses says, when he says to Moses, I'll send an angel and that you'll still get there. Moses says, no, it's not the land I want. If you don't go, I don't want to go. Ladies, Moses said, your presence is more important to me than me getting the land. 
If we could get to that place where his presence, because when his presence is there, we have the favor of God. That's what Moses says. I want your favor. I want your presence. You ladies, if we could get to that place in prayer when we have his presence and his presence is there, his favor is there, we, under, we start to hear him and understand what his will is. What Moses does is, I want to give you these things. Number one, Moses prays for God's presence. You and I, let's pray for his presence. It's not so much the thing I want. It's your presence I have to have. His presence is more important than the thing that you and I want. Number two, Moses prays according to God's promises. Moses reminds God of his favor. And his prayer is based on God's statement of promise. Remember I said you got to know what God's word says in order to pray his word. And then number three, what Moses does is the goal of Moses' prayer is to have knowledge. Moses wants the knowledge of God. I really believe that when we pray and we want the knowledge of God, ladies, I believe that our prayer changes. Our attitudes change. Our focus change. And then number four, favor comes through the knowledge of the Lord. In Exodus 33, 13, he says, show me your ways, Lord. Show me your ways. An unwillingness to learn about God is a personal invitation to shipwrecking your own faith. Praying to know God is evidence of a heart that has God's law written on it. Praying to know God is evidence of a heart that has God's law written on it. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're teaching us as we study your word. And we we know you want us to pray. And Moses is the man who answered your call because there was a cause. God, I pray that we would stop and realize that there is a cause. And there is a call on our life. Help us to be committed in that. As we pray, you're going to take us deeper. You're going to reveal things to us that you want us to do that take us to a place where we're not comfortable. Where we have to face some things that we've been running from. And it's all for your glory. You delivered the Israelites for your glory and that you may make yourself known. As we pray, make yourself known to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I pray you were blessed by the message today. As you can see, prayer is not about long phrases or flattery words, but it is one of the ways that we connect to Jesus Christ through prayer, the discipline of prayer. I encourage you to put into practice what you are learning as you and I continue to learn how to live a praying life. I'll see you next time.